The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Snapshot for Queensland Council's webinar number two, working with the community and setting targets before anything. This is a little fail safe mechanism just to check. Can people hear me and see a big thing that just says hello? Um, jump into the chat box for all of you guys who have been here before, and I know there are a few of you. If you could please, thank you very much. Thanks, Heidi. Awesome. We will then move straight on. Very first, I'd just like to acknowledge the First Nation people throughout the nation and where I'm speaking from on the traditional lands of the people of the Kulin Nation, the Wurundjeri people in Melbourne. I wish to acknowledge them as the traditional owners and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and the elders from other communities and acknowledge that the land on which I'm meeting on and we're meeting on here is of age old ceremonies of celebration, initiation and renewal, and the land was never ceded. My name is Alexi Lynch from Ironbark Sustainability. Uh, we've got some very special guests here today as we run through the agenda. Imogen Jubb from Beyond Zero Emissions, Michael Poulton from the Committee for Ballarat, and Heidi Edmonds from BZE, who I will introduce once they are ready and speaking. The agenda today, a bit of an intro and uh, update, um, then some some updates specifically on Snapshot and around Google Transport, which is pretty exciting, and some news that's um, hot off the press, I guess, and going to impact on a lot of Queensland councils in the next few weeks as well that we can share. We'll go into setting targets. That was something that came through as feedback from the last webinar. Then we've got Michael talking about Snapshot in Action and how they've been using it in Ballarat. And then Heidi talking about the Gladstone Renewable Energy Industrial Precinct. And then we'll have a good 15 minutes or so for Q&A. Speaking of Q&A and housekeeping, firstly, only presenters can be heard or seen during this presentation. It's a little bit different to Zoom and Teams. Uh, with GoToWebinar, you can ask questions at any time during the webinar just typing them into your GoToWebinar question box. Um, jump in, we'll try and answer the questions as we go along. Depending on the number of questions, we may wait until the end to answer them. Uh, if we don't follow up today, we'll give you a buzz or get onto any unanswered questions with people after the webinar. But please jump into that question box at any time, any burning questions, things that you, you didn't put in advance and you want to ask, jump in, be as specific and clear as possible in writing your questions and we'll answer them. This is us, Ironbark. We're a, a local government uh, consultancy. We work with councils all around Australia on climate change and um, energy efficiency, renewable energy projects. That's all we do. This is the Melbourne office. We've got about 35 odd staff. Um, we work on key energy efficiency and operational projects, but also broader sort of climate programs with um, councils. Another thing that we do, and we do with Beyond Zero Emissions and ICLEI Local Governments for Sustainability, this is the first of two reminders of this, is that we've developed this Local Government Climate Review a couple of years ago that's been used extensively to seek funding, to into parliamentary inquiries and to inform policy. Um, and it informed something like Snapshot a few years ago. We're putting the call out again for responses um, and if you're able to jump into that survey, you don't have to worry about putting it down because we'll send it through afterwards, but please do um, jump on once you get the post survey or post webinar email and give us a bit of your time because it's really valuable. It's something that's put in and developed by lots of organisations. Um, Jessica, I've just got your email and you're saying you can't get any audio. I'm sorry, I can't give you direct tips now, but maybe if I can just ask the other attendees, some there that we know, Dorian, Judy, Leah, can you guys just let us know, and Tim, that you can hear me. Um, you just got me worried there that that's not actually the case. Yep, thanks, Tim. Jess, sorry, we are recording it though, so worst case scenario, um, you'll be able to look at this post 
um, webinar. This is you. They're the people that have registered for today's webinar, so welcome. We asked in advance whether you're happy sharing your details. Thank you to those that are, and there are a few that were remaining anonymous, but um, a nice mix. Hopefully there are some familiar names to you there. This is also you. We've got mainly people that have been at council for at least a couple of years. Um, we've got very few questions today, so keep them coming throughout the session. Um, that first one's been answered, that second one we'll jump on to at the end. And finally, this was the feedback we had from the last webinar. So for those that attended the first one in December, thank you very much. That's the, all of the feedback and we do use it to inform this webinar. We do listen to the feedback. For example, we also asked what you would like this next one to be about. And here are the results. And so subsequently is what we're doing today. Um, so when the feedback form does come through at the end of this one, do fill it in because we will listen and shape the webinar and any of the information based on um, what you put forward. We're working really closely with DES and also the LGAQ in developing these webinars. So shout out and thanks to Alex, Alice, Susan and Dorian as well. And the next webinar is now locked in. Um, again, there'll be the registration form sent through post this webinar. Uh, it's on Thursday the 29th at 11am. Chuck it in your diary. We've already got one special guest, David Micklejohn from the Northern Alliance for Greenhouse Action and the guy that's heading up Climate Emergency Australia. Um, again, based on some of the feedback we had from the last one. So that should be great. Before we get into a snapshot update, I'm just going to quickly pass over to Imogen Jubb from Beyond Zero Emissions. Imogen, the National Manager of the Zero Carbon Communities Initiative supporting 100 odd communities around Australia to achieve net zero emissions. Background in climate change, education, science, communications, a million, trillion things, and also was key to developing a uh, snapshot involved in the Million Jobs Plan. Imogen, over to you. Did you want me to share the your screen or are you right just to chat? I'm right just to chat, that's fine. Um, I'll be pretty brief. Um, but just wanted to give a little bit of context about the work that BZE has been doing. Uh, we have been working with communities for quite a few years now and have also been really forging partnerships with councils as part of that process. Um, there's about 130 communities registered around Australia with our Zero Carbon Communities Project. And we're also looking at how to localise information from the Million Jobs Plan and other bits of our research reports to really show how they can be implemented in practice at the local scale. Uh, Heidi will talk about that today uh, for a really exciting project in Gladstone. And Michael will talk about uh, some work that we've been doing with him where um, we're really looking at their snapshot emissions profile and trying to identify what the most effective actions of a particular community can do um, and help embedding their community. Um, so, breaking up. more and more examples of snapshot snatch, of being used in practice to set target communities um, and councils. And we're also starting to see the end of the ambition of councils really rising in terms of their. Uh, I'll switch into the NSF, but I'll, I'll wrap up this to be quick. Where the final point is the rise in ambition of. Um, hang on. <laughs> uh, 2020 lives on. You're breaking up, Imogen. Um, do you want to give it one more go? I can switch the internet, but I've really only got one more point to make, which is just that the ambition of of targets um, is really rising at both what councils are setting and what the communities are expecting as well. So instead of setting 2050 targets, uh, we're really seeing a sharp increase in the rate of um, council um, corporate targets as well as community-wide targets. I'll leave it there if it's breaking up. Thanks Imogen and um, that's Great context because um, when we move on to targets as well in about 10 minutes time and we'll go through some of the targets that councils are actually setting, some very recent ones, and it reflects exactly what you're saying. So 
we'll get into some advice and some high level updates there and what councils are setting um, from a community wide perspective. And yeah, it's sort of emerging that 2050 net zero is not going to be enough. Um, and we'll touch on that as we get to it. Thanks, um, Imogen from BZE, an internationally recognised climate change think tank, um, who hopefully are very well known to most people by now and key um, brains and partner with us to Snapshot. All right, on to Snapshot. Um, a couple of years ago, and I guess this is going back from the, the, the bit onto the previous uh, webinar that we held as well, part of, the, part of the process and the approach to Snapshot is making sure that the data we have is complete because complete data is what's required, that sort of criteria of completeness to satisfy international protocols, um, which is what we've done. So we've got all the key sectors within anyone here, your Snapshot has residential, industrial and commercial electricity. It's got gas use, if applicable, uh, waste, agriculture, and of course, transport. And so from the very start, we've been well aware of, you know, areas where we could potentially improve, uh, where we could get better granularity or accuracy. But certainly the first thing was to, to make sure that we have a complete data set that we do. The main thing has not been so much big slabs of missing information or data, but whether or not it's been possible to get more detail or further granularity. And this has very much been the challenge and something that we've been working on behind the scenes for many years. In fact, if we go back and for those that have been at previous webinars or presentations, you'll have seen slides like this from 2017 and 2019 where we've talked about, hey, we're trying to improve and get better accuracy. It depends on who the data providers are. Often it depends on the state or territory and sometimes you know, it depends on distribution business level. But all in all, this kind of journey that we've been going on, journey, sorry, um, has been basically to try and make data improvements and get better accuracy and then apply it to as many councils as possible. One area that we've obviously looked at has been in transport. So transport traditionally, probably for every single missions profile in history, if we're gonna be honest, has been model data. Sure, you can get little pockets of real activity data, but generally you're not gonna know about that particular trip that's gone from Redcliffe Beach into the center of Brisbane. Instead, what happens is we, as a sector, as an industry, for the last 20 years, have used model information and model data that scales down to the municipal level from high level sort of sources, which is in theory problematic because we don't know for sure how, for example, we would allocate or attribute the emissions from this particular trip. Whose is it? Really, it should be that the first part or the second part, however well which way that thing is traveling is for Brisbane, and the second part of that journey, once you hit the Ted's Mount Memorial Bridge, I think it is, is Moreton Bay. In an ideal world, you would be able to allocate the emissions according to the boundary. However, it's very hard because we don't have access to every single car journey. Um, we don't have you know, that kind of granularity of data. So what generally happens is we have modeled information. And so what we've seen on snapshots from here so far has been something like this. What we have been able to do recently, though, through a partnership with Google and their Environmental Insights Explorer, is to actually get that level of information and that level of granularity, because Google, of course, do have that info. That's a Google screenshot there, really, from you know a traffic mapping. But they have an understanding because they use phone data to understand where people are, which suddenly means instead of having modeled data for a profile, we can improve the accuracy and we can work with the likes of Google to actually break it down further and use the real activity data. So it's a pretty big step forward. Um, there's still a long way to go, but we're thrilled with this. What it means specifically for Queensland councils is if you were to have looked on the last um, probably three or four months, you'll find that there are three councils that have Google Transport data, um, which is okay, but not great if you're not in one of those three. Um, what we can say is that when we first spoke to Google, they've been quite amazing and were able to give us access to 100 odd councils around Australia based on population and density and a few other factors. In the next couple of weeks, what we'll see on Google's Environmental Insights Explorer and on Snapshot, uh, these councils will also have 
data from Google. And so your profiles will look a lot more like this than like this. Um, where are we? Um, now those names have come straight from the Google database and so there might be some clarifications there, but you get the picture. What you'll find is all of those councils have got populations of over 25,000, which is the threshold for privacy from a Google point of view, and also are able to satisfy other criteria around density and other factors. Um, but it's pretty exciting stuff. We think it's pretty exciting because it means that we can start thinking about what more detailed profiles mean, start thinking about planning of interventions, because we can better model and understand what's happening. And we can also start talking to Google about what happens next. Can we get more granularity according to temporal data or you know, the postcode level or whatever it might be and their discussions that we're having um, along this journey. One key thing to keep in mind too is that when we started talking to Google and um, I think we're, we want to make sure this is, this is clear and isn't changing in our approach, but we didn't ask for data from, for councils that we're working with or councils that are you know, friendly to us or certain regions. Basically what we've said to Google the whole time is that we want to make sure that we're working to support Australian councils and communities at large. So everything we do is about collective action. And so it's no longer really okay to just be working on sourcing data for your council or your community or your region when we're talking about this scale or level of data. Obviously, if it's about local traffic, traffic planning, then the local data is critical. But if you're speaking to a distribution business or a let's hypothetically say a Telstra or an Optus for information that they can provide to everybody that really needs to be looking at that macro level. So an improvement for one council, region or state is not enough and we get that improvement for all. It's, it's exciting because it means also that there are these future opportunities coming up with um, Google, more so than just transport emissions, but also things like air quality and tree canopy. And when you start talking to these, you know, big data providers, suddenly the conversation changes. And here in Australia, we, the collective we, really have a chance to get on the front foot because this is the whole list of partners that Google are working with internationally. Um, and we're the ones that have this partnership with them. So jump on board and get involved and give us your ideas because we do have a chance to really push things. Just bear in mind that the whole time we're going to be guided by making sure that the approach is there for everyone. Okay, targets. And while I'm quickly moving to targets, again, just a reminder, jump into that Q&A question box if you've got any questions. Um, around that Google data set, what it means, how it works. We'll be able to answer it today or get into it in the future or whatever it is, but that's the update, which is exciting. And in the next week or two, you will see your profiles updated. So setting emissions targets and specifically community emissions targets was something that Imogen touched on before and an area that is quite well known to us in Australia. There's, um, as I'm sure everyone here would probably know, over the last 15, 20 years, there have been times when most councils in Australia actually had targets for their corporate and community emissions through international programs and large programs like Cities for Climate Protection way back in the day. Last webinar in December, we looked at snapshot pathways and we're trying to get better data. We're looking at action planning, collaborative approaches, reporting, and a key part of it was targets. And so we're, we're having conversations still now about whether there's a way to incorporate targets within Snapshot. So there's an easy place for everybody to um, jump on and say, these are our targets and or this is what our science-based or science-derived target or carbon budget is, which takes the sort of guesswork a little bit out of it as well because it actually gives you a fixed amount that you get to deal with. Um, help me. We're not going to get into the detail of how you develop science-based targets, but once you and when you, and here's another little pitch to make sure you fill in the feedback at the end of this in the survey, um, we'll send you the survey, um, sorry, the presentation pack and all the presentations today, including, including a 20-page document that will actually go through just the basic information on this. Um, so we 
there's, there's a fair bit of water under the bridge when it comes to the development of targets in Australia and where things are at. And we'll touch the surface here. We'll give you some sort of ideas and recommendations based on the requests from last time. Um, but you've also got a, a doco there with some of the background information if it's of help once you've finished. Um, so a question that we asked at a webinar last year or the year before, we often ask about targets. And just like we've asked you guys questions before this webinar, we often ask in advance a couple of things to get an idea about what the attendees are thinking and how to frame it. And one of the questions we asked um, around targets is why you think it's important to have a community emissions target. So getting into the real first principles, and I guess I'd put it to you there to have a think about. Here is the sort of response, a little word cloud from a group of, this was about 100 odd councils that um, came to a recent webinar, the kind of stuff that we would expect. Setting, you know, targets will help us understand, you know, what we need to, to get to, um, uh, you know, to get to reduce our emissions, a sense of accountability, actually measuring what we're doing and understanding our progress and, and these sort of things. Um, there was an interesting point that was brought up in a recent webinar though, when we asked why do you think it's important to have a community emissions target? And this was from a council, this was from a climate action officer who said, I'm not sure it is. And while my general take and our general take is that it is actually very important to have a target, I think it's just worth taking a little step back because every council is different. And this particular person said the struggle they have is that their councillors or six of nine don't believe in anthropogenic climate change, don't believe local government has a role. So what do they do? In which case, while a target I would argue is still quite important, you know, understanding that a council's capacity to set targets, plan, deliver emissions reductions is a dynamic product of factors such as community and council support, resourcing and your internal and external policy settings, um, capacity, technology options, there's a lot going on. And so in this case, sometimes the better approach is possibly to maybe Google risk Sarah Barker from Minter Ellison who speaks on these things. And instead of potentially spending too much time looking at targets, looking at, let's just say, scaring council laws or understanding that they're gonna have fiduciary duties that they need to respond to. So they need to start looking at it and using that as the driver for action. There are many reasons and many um, uh, factors that are gonna impact on whether or not you are gonna set targets um, and different reasons for different councils. Here are some of the key ones though. The first one is to measure success. So how, how will we achieve what we need to do? Measuring the efficacy of what you're actually doing. Driving action and what's more at the required level commensurate to the problem at hand. So focusing your efforts and resourcing on finding the best and most efficient route to reaching the target. Um, this provides a vital context for action plans, for example. For some, it's about having a common goal. For others, it's about accountability internally to the community to make sure that we're doing what we said we were gonna do. Targets are often and have been used simply to inspire and other times without maybe worrying so much about the accountability or the success side of things, councils are using it to motivate stakeholders, a group of stakeholders to achieve a particular outcome. So I guess it's just important to acknowledge that everything and everyone is a bit different. Um, we think it's pretty important and can provide that vital context for action planning, but for different councils, you might have different reasons to set targets. Targets are everywhere. We've all probably heard of smart targets, specific, achievable, timely, measurable, and realistic. Um, this is important in some contexts, but again, perhaps not always. So for example, when you're thinking about your target or setting a target for emissions reduction in the community, down the track for your council, look at some of the other reasons that people, organisations set targets. So this is from a road safety campaign. I think this is in New South Wales and Victoria towards zero. This is designed to inspire, to educate and to promote. It's been really effective, but it's not smart. It's probably not achievable to have zero road toll deaths and it's not time bound. That's okay. It's not designed to do those things. It's more to inspire, educate and promote. Likewise, God, we all had targets last year, potentially, probably all rooted in the science. This targets communicated in a very, a very complicated thing in a simple way. That was the aim of having things like trying to keep the rolling 14 day average under five and these sort of things that especially those down south will probably shiver about 
for many years to come. But targets like that were used to, again, just communicate something in a simple way that could have been, and for some people, is very complex. Targets can be used to show leadership, to celebrate, to inspire. There's a lot of different reasons and targets can change. So the ALP are looking nationally at a you know, net zero by 2050 target. Um, what they're probably thinking about is this thing called the Overton window, a range of ideas that the public is willing to consider and accept. So you know, ideas that a politician could successfully campaign on. Um, this will not necessarily be what you might consider a science-derived target, but it is important still to keep these things in mind. And finally, just to point out that this is from a council plan and it talks about targets around um, community health. So, you know, percentage of people that are satisfied with their health and council has some targets. And I think the important thing to talk about here is that council does not have total control over this. And one of the reasons that some councils don't want to set community targets is that they think, well, we don't have control over it. But really, we all the time set targets that we don't necessarily have control over. The key is to just communicate this. Australian local government targets have long been aspirational, but they're starting to move to science-based or science-derived. And so basically what that means is that the actual target itself is something that comes from an external scientific basis. So the good topical example here is around measles um, and vaccinations. So for herd immunity, you need to have a coverage rate of 94%. Australia's target is 95% in line with the science. And the key here is the science doesn't really care whether you have a target of 90 or 75 or 73. 94% is what is needed. And so the science derived target comes from an external factor and really doesn't care what other people think. It is what it is. In the context of local governments and science derived targets, it's done through a process of looking at the global, then the Australian, and then a local carbon budget. You have a budget, it is what it is. And then if we're gonna believe, or if we're gonna trust the science of the IPCC, which is where that global budget comes from, that is the threshold that we cannot go over. When we try and simplify it, what it means is that we generally, depending on whether you wanna use the two or one and a half degree science, somewhere around the, well, for one and a half degrees, it is argued that that's already been blown. Some will say there is still time. And for the two degrees tipping point target, somewhere from nine to 16 degrees, when we put that to councils. The, the message here and one of the things that we will advocate for is though that we've got a critical decade, which is essentially over the next 10 years. And we're starting to see that come through in council targets. So this is current councils that have net zero community emissions targets. And I think I'd point out, going back to the point that Imogen made before, there are no councils at the moment that are setting community emissions targets that don't have net zero. No one's saying we want to reduce by 50% by 2030 and that's it. They generally have net zero targets somewhere in the next 20, 30 years. Um, forgive me if any of these have been updated recently. Um, and if there are any Queensland councils that do have community emissions targets, um, let us know from the survey. There's about 10 or 11 that have responded and we've still got zero, but do jump in and let us know if there are any. Noosa, Heidi, I think Noosa's is a community one, but that's one that we should check on maybe they did adopt it and if they do i apologize profusely to any we kind of have a net zero target australia wide thanks to all the the states um, going for net zero by 2050 and i guess one of the key things and where snapshot comes into it too is that this shows us the the challenge that is ahead of us and so when we're looking about climate action and we're looking at the targets and these big numbers need to get to zero once you start overlaying the, the carbon budget to these sort of things, we really need to start reducing emissions by you know, anywhere from three to 5% per year. We're not fiddling around the edges here. And so targets then become important to inform action planning to understand that the scale of action is really large. Um, the final point I'll make, I guess, is just that while targets are important to set, they should be net zero now. Um, and um, they do help explain the urgency um, of what we are facing. Um, it potentially can be something that takes you off the main game, which of course is that we have this very serious problem. We need to do things in line with what is required. And so a target is important, 
but we very quickly need to move on from target setting to developing the strategies, action evaluating to make sure that we're actually doing the right things. A couple of quick take home messages before I introduce our first guest. Um, look, understand the analysis and the science, it's what your budget is because you'll probably see that that is then aligned with a target of net zero within sort of the next 10 or so years. Once you have that, you've got something based on science, IPCC and local data. It's your choice whether you adopt it or you communicate it, but understand that it's essentially a not negotiable target like the 94% coverage for measles and, and vaccine. Um, you don't get to choose what the science and evidence says, but you absolutely get to decide how to respond and have an understanding of it, which is um, I think pretty important. The other thing is the urgency of the problem and discussing it with key stakeholders and how to um, resource the required response. I think this is where Snapshot is quite important because it shows the, the issue at hand, but also how, as we go back to some of those um, snapshots that I showed you earlier, a lot of the reduction, of course, will come from the natural decarbonisation of the grid and other bits and pieces. You should be understanding and used for action planning, so the scale and where the sorts of emissions reduction um, will be happening. Use it as a call to action and make it work from you and use it to be accountable, but also be really clear on the line of accountability and getting back to that example from a council plan, looking at community health and these sort of things. Um, in the past, councils have often been criticised for not meeting community-wide targets, often because of how they've been framed. And so borrowing from the fields of um, international and community development, it's important to communicate that the budget and target is what's required by the science for the whole municipality but it's absolutely not council's responsibility alone to meet that target. Just like it's absolutely not council's responsibility um, on your own to be meeting certain you know, health and community um, targets. It requires support and action at all levels of the community, business and government. And recent climate emergency action plans are really exceptional at making this differentiation clear, so it's worth checking them out. And finally, be mercenary. So make sure you do what works for you to actually reduce emissions. And so if the target needs to be one that's more around inspiration or more around simplifying a as something that's hard to communicate, then that's what you should focus on. All right, while I am passing over to Michael Poulton, I'm going to ask again whether people would like to have any questions or comments, jump into the question box. And while I change presenters to Michael Poulton, I think I'll introduce you, Michael. Welcome. Michael's the CEO of the Committee for Ballarat. Um, and the committee has approximately 120 odd members ranging from the biggest employers in the region to sole traders. They play a critical role in uh, um, the region through our thought leadership, advocacy, working in collaboration with businesses and all three tiers of government. Michael, welcome along. Thank you, uh, Lexi, I appreciate that. And I uh, was really interested in that conversation around targets. Um, I hope you can all hear me and I uh, hope you can see a screen that's got a very pretty picture of a windmill at sun, or windmills at sunset. But wow. before yep. I start, uh, if I can just um, acknowledge Ballarat is a, a town of about 120,000 people. It's 120 kilometres west of Melbourne. And I would like to acknowledge that it is the lands and always will be the lands of the Wathaurong people. And I pay my respects to their elders past and present and welcome any Aboriginal or First Nations people who are with us today. Um, this is beautiful lands. Um, Ballarat is, uh, is a Wathaurong word for resting place in a cool climate. Um, but we do have an abundance of wind and uh, that's, um, I'll talk more about that shortly. So look, I think um, just to give you a bit of a snapshot of what Ballarat the committee for Ballarat has been doing in relation to uh, the snapshot data as a starting point, but most importantly, I think our relationship with, with BZE. Um, and uh, note Heidi and Imogen who are online today, it's fantastic to have your, your continuing support in this space. Um, the committee for Ballarat is a business organisation. Um, Lexi mentioned that in the introduction. We have 120 odd members uh, from the, the largest employers to the smallest sole traders. We do capture the biggest industries in town. Um, we have a very good working relationship with our local government, the city for Ballarat, 
And our role really is in advocacy, uh, thought leadership in relation to the big issues that set our region up for a prosperous and sustainable future. Um, so that's what we do uh, and that's where we are. Um, a bit of information that underpins it, um, and this comes from the Clean Energy Council. Victoria, like all states, uh, are investing heavily in, in large scale renewable projects. Um, in the central highlands, which is my region, um, by and large, that's wind generation. And currently we have the most highly densely um, populated wind generation in the country at this stage. We're about to uh, build the largest uh, wind farm in the Southern Hemisphere uh, on our doorstep. Um, there is great opportunity here for wind, which is why this conversation has generated such interest and, and, and uh, enthusiasm. The, uh, the interesting proposition between the committee and City for Ballarat is that we've got this really unique opportunity to pull together uh, a multi-stakeholder partnership, uh, a partnership that really is driven by business, um, but capturing the opportunities that sit in, in local government st and state government particularly. So the city of Ballarat has long held a, um, a target for net zero emissions for their own operations by 2025. Um, and that's a quite an ambitious target that was set four years ago. Um, they can't achieve it on their own. They can achieve it in part through their own operations, but the critical thing, and this is what Snapshot really showed us, was that there was a whole lot of industrial emissions from the city um, more broadly. So when I talk about the community, I talk about the community as a whole, um, being business, industry, residents, uh, the community aspect of that, and certainly the city of Ballarat is, can, is, is involved in that. So this multi-stakeholder collaboration is what was critical. So for Ballarat to become a sustainable city, carbon neutral, driven by 100% renewables, we needed to do this in collaboration with business, industry and the community. Um, why? Um, it does attract investment. We see it as being a critical part of our competitive advantage to bring investment, innovation to Ballarat, to the Central Highlands region, um, where you can uh, offer energy at, uh, at a significantly lower cost to what it currently is, and particularly offer renewable energy. It attracts, as we all know, it attracts a certain level of investor, it attracts a particular type of business for those who are wanting to come and make the most of uh, renewables. Um, clearly it's about reducing energy costs, but it's also about, absolutely about reducing industrial emissions. The other thing that's worth putting in context um, with Ballarat and the Queenslanders might recognise this. Um, we're a bit like Toowoomba. Um, you know, we're just far enough out of the metropolitan city. We're not too big, we're not too small, we're just the right size. We have great access to transport links uh, and this abundance of renewables. So with Beyond Zero Emissions, we were able to secure um, a partnership with the NAB Bank um, that was coordinated through Australian business volunteers. So Committee for Ballarat, Beyond Zero Emissions, NAB and Australian uh, business volunteers came together with a proposal to say from our perspective, from a committee's perspective, it was to identify the key industries and have the data to make decisions about the most su suitable emissions reduction business models based on robust cost benefit analysis and risk assessment. The work hadn't been done here as a collective. You've got individual businesses, individual industries who had done some of this uh, business modelling in terms of, uh, of, of their own emissions reduction and how they might move to, to, to less reliance on electricity or gas. Um, but what hadn't been done was a whole of, of region approach to it, a whole of city approach to it. So we're really interested in bringing together the big industries in town, um, including the city of Ballarat, and taking a snapshot as to what the costs of energy was, how that might impact in terms of uh, the capacity for us to invest in other ways that would help to um, reduce our emissions. So you see on screen there, there's nine companies who are involved in the particular research, um, and the research involved uh, really detailed um, qualitative assessments of, of understanding business needs and of those who were involved, what they were doing in relation to trying to reduce their own emissions. And what became apparent in those, those nine conversations um, 
and they are the, the biggest industries in our town, what became apparent was that they all had similar desires, um, they all had similar challenges, um, and they're all trying to solve the problem, the same problems by and large, but they were trying to solve those problems individually. So this just strengthened the, the sense of, if we look at this as a sum of the parts model, we look at this as a whole regional approach, then uh, we're gonna be far better placed to position Ballarat as a renewable centre of excellence for, for the country. Um, and why Ballarat? Because we have this great access to wind that's sitting on our doorstep. We've got uh, businesses who are aligned to say, we want to achieve this. We've got a clear vision. We've got a city that's saying, we want to get to net zero uh, in our own emissions. And that's really provided some leadership for, for the rest of, uh, rest of the town. So where does the snapshot data uh, sit in relation to this and it's been critical I think as a starting point for us to understand the need uh, and to look at industrial emissions as, a, as, as where they sit or in terms of a componentry and where it's broken up in terms of electricity and gas um, and I think the big learning out of this is that from a electricity perspective there is great sense in our businesses moving to renewables in all sorts of ways and wind, solar and storage are absolutely the foundations of that. Um, but there is a model which uh, we're looking to pursue a bit further, which I'll, I'll show you in a moment or two. But it, it showed us that there is this, uh, this demand and this need and being able to pull apart the data um, made lots of sense. The granularity of that, which Alexi spoke of earlier, um, doesn't show in these slides, but the, the, uh, the databasing and the work that sits behind this and particularly then the economic modeling that gets uh, um, equivocated to it is substantial and we we're able to get both electricity and the gas usage by and large for 10 of our biggest industries nine of whom were also involved in the qualitative component to it we also got the, uh, the electricity data from the six substations in Ballarat which supplies the residential commercial and industrial area and the ability then to be able to model that was pretty substantial um, what those graphs also show you is that electricity usage has been on the way down in Ballarat and a bit of, bit of that is about the big industries now looking to divest from, from the network uh, and be looking at renewables as part of their mix. Um, the other two lines by and large are, are reasonably stable but what it does show is that electricity particularly makes up a significant amount of our emissions and it's also the thing that given our geographical location is the thing that can be quite easily reduced. So the next slide, and this was the one that was a little bit gobsmacking for us, um, and uh, it is uh, there is a caveat on this that it was a uh, it's quite difficult to I guess put a number, um, an accurate number around electricity use simply because there is so much so many fluctuations in the marketplace. But what we've taken here is uh, a snapshot of the the nine sorry, the, the 10 industries who provided data for us, as well as the six substations. We've looked into the, uh, the, the snapshot climate emissions data, um, the work that Iron Bark has done in this regard. And we've picked a, a midpoint really for the pricing point uh, in and around that usage. But what it shows us is 225 million a year is spent on just electricity. Uh, and that it's 142 megawatts per hour on average, so per annum. So it's a, we've got a large volume of electricity. Um, we've got a significant amount of money being spent. Um, and what becomes then really uh, attractive to business is to say, well, how might we invest some of that money in a different way to look at reducing that overall cost? And that's been the significance of this. If we took 5% or 10% of that 225 million to invest in alternative forms of providing electricity, you had a really uh, large, got a strong critical mass, you've got a strong value proposition to go to the market to be looking at, uh, at new technologies and new ways of providing energy. Which leads me just to the final slide, which is some work that we're doing with Mondo at the moment. Uh, interestingly, some of you might be aware, uh, Osnet, Mondo, uh, 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 Osnet, which is the um, other half of Mondo, essentially provide the, the poles and, and lines. They, they are the ones who build the transmission network around the country. Uh, their subsidiary in Mondo is looking at ways of trying to move away from this centralised market. So what are, the, what are the alternatives going to look like? We all appreciate that the, um, the national energy grid is not 
necessarily fit for purpose as it currently is. It was built for a, a time, a generation past, and we need to look at evolving what that, that national energy market looks like. Um, and the decentralised market, a local decentralised market, is the thing that we're looking to try and achieve. And what's important about a town the size of Ballarat or a city the size of Ballarat, um, that the notion of a microgrid is not the ambition. We don't want to be uh, contained in our own little way. We don't want to be off grid. We don't want to be fully self-sufficient. What we want to be able to do is to be able to provide electricity, particularly electricity for our own community and then be a net exporter into the national energy grid. We need to ensure that the stabilisation of the centralised grid is there but the shift has to be more towards a 50-50 breakdown of that where decentralised markets also play a critical part in the, uh, in the uh, generation and transmission of electricity. We think that's a way of significantly being able to bring down emissions because it does facilitate the capacity for much greater use of renewables in a localised area. And we believe that the centralised market doesn't have the capability at the moment and to pick up that capability is an extremely costly and a very, very long-term process. So the decentralised market, a mix of decentralised and centralised markets uh, needs to be the mix moving forward um, to reduce energy costs, to innovate, to bring new job creation and importantly to take carbon out of the atmosphere. So that's where we're heading. Um, the work that we've done with, with, uh, with BZE and particularly the snapshot data was, was critical in terms of setting this up to begin with and BZE's association with, uh, with MAB uh, and the capacity for us to use uh, nine, sorry, 11, 11 um, MAB execs for nine days essentially, full time working on this project for us with a different set of eyes and looking at it from an economic analysis point of view was, uh, was just incredible. So a really good outcome for, for Ballarat, for our project. Um, we hope it's also an outcome that BZE can then start to model and say, how might we apply this to, to or replicate this in other regional cities around the country? We know the model works for smaller for, for, for smaller um, rural and regional areas, but the challenge always was, can you upscale this to regional cities? Um, and we think the model is, uh, is applicable. So, it helps to provide that financial analysis, it helps to provide some, some modelling, and it gives uh, great evidence to the, both qualitative and quantitative to the need to move towards, in our case, this notion of a localised or local centralised market. So Alexi, I'm happy to, to leave it there um, and take any questions that people might have either on the chat or, uh, or directly. So I'm happy to stop sharing the screen now. Fantastic, many thanks. For that, Michael, that's um, fascinating and love the way that you've been able to look at using Snapshot and then try to incorporate the the, um, the localised data as well, um, which is a, a fantastic way to do it. And um, yeah, there, we might be interested to maybe look on why you'd... Did you ever look at getting off-grid and some of these options? But we, we might just pass on to um, Heidi first. So Heidi's a Queensland project manager at BZE. Um, leading the work on the Gladstone Renewable Energy Industrial Precinct Project for her hometown of Gladstone, a chemical and environmental engineer, ecologist with a PhD in environmental science. Um, Heidi, over to you. Take us away. Tell us what's going on here. Thank you very much, Alexi. And first of all, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm here in Brisbane today on the lands of the Yuggera and Turbal people. But this project, which focuses on Gladstone, focuses on the lands of the Balai, Gurang, Gurang and Tarabalang Vanda nations in Gladstone. Um, so first of all, I'll just tell you a little bit about, I'm um, just going to try to whiz through this in um, six minutes, repowering Australian manufacturing through renewable energy industrial precincts. I'll give you a bit of an overview of the overall, um, it's called a REAP project, which is focused on the Hunter and Gladstone at this point, and then I'll focus in on Gladstone and show you the snapshot profile for Gladstone. Beyond Zero Emissions um, have a range of research which we've done in the past, which supports the, the work that we're doing here, including our electrifying industry report and our Million Jobs Plan report, which came out in June last year and talks about the many great jobs in renewable energy and climate action as a way to rebuild our economy. We had a we had some really positive um, impacts 
um, with the Million Jobs Plan, highlighting some of the key areas for jobs, including renewable energy, buildings, and manufacturing and mining. So this project sits under that area, the manufacturing side of um, emissions. What is a renewable energy industrial precinct? It's a cluster of manufacturers powered by 100% renewable energy, located within renewable energy zones or well connected to them. They tend to be centres of manufacturing for energy intensive exports. So those um, sustainable industrial heritage areas with, with heavy industry is where we're initially focusing our efforts. There are opportunities all around Australia, including Gladstone and Townsville in Queensland, Mount Isa potentially. Um, as I mentioned, the Hunter Valley and Gladstone are our first two priorities, priority areas. And if you go to the Beyond Zero Emissions website, you can find out more about these projects. Why is a renewable energy industrial precinct a great idea? The demand for low emissions goods is a massive opportunity. A massive opportunity. Companies with strong targets to reduce emissions in supply chains are rapidly growing. Investors see high carbon industry as a risk. Over $14 trillion have been divested and this amount is growing. And countries over 70 have already announced net zero targets and this number is growing. Australia is uniquely place to supply this demand for products that are made with low, low amounts of carbon. We have fantastic wind, we just heard about the wind resources in Ballarat, fantastic wind and solar resources as well as locations that have wind and solar coexisting um, in the same location. What is Beyond Zero Emissions doing at the moment? We've put together a national policy framework for renewable energy industrial precincts which we prepared with WWF and submitted as a pre-budget submission. Our CEO, Heidi Lee, was just talking to the federal government earlier this week about this project, seeking $2 billion for funding for five renewable energy industrial precincts across Australia. We're briefing government, we're showcasing industry support, and we're making sure Australia doesn't lose its competitive advantage in a zero emissions global race. We're calling on government, council, industry, manufacturers to support us. We're calling for expressions of interest. There's a link at the bottom of this page here to the Gladstone Renewable Energy Industrial Precinct site. And from there, companies are invited to provide expressions of interest or statements of support. We're providing briefings to existing manufacturers, new manufacturers, investors, and customers in the market. So please go to bze.org.au and you can find out more information there. So a couple of the quick slides on Gladstone. Why is Gladstone an ideal location? It has several advantages, including the infrastructure, land which can be zoned industrial, a skilled, capable workforce working in heavy industry, which can um, work in manufacturing and resource processing. It also has the universities there. So it has the, and as well as the port, the deep water port, very important for getting those um, export pro products like hydrogen, renewable hydrogen out and things like that. So I realise we're very short on time because it's been a jam packed agenda. So just a quick click up of the Gladstone um, emissions snapshot profile. And you can see industrial electricity um, use is, 35% of Gladstone's emissions and industrial gas use is 13% of Gladstone's emissions. So it's definitely a priority area for a renewable energy industrial precinct. In terms of reducing Gladstone's emissions, um, the industry side is an important facet. And just as an Australian overview, fossil fuels for manufacturing generate 8% of Australia's emissions and that doesn't include the process emissions, so the emissions that come from um, the, the actual process of different um, chemical process and things like that. I'm going to end that presentation there and very happy to um, take any questions now or in, or in the future on this and great to see some interest um, coming um, in the Gladstone week. Thanks Alexi. Thanks Heidi, that is awesome. A question for you, how did you go with the feds this week? 
the, we've been working with the federal government um, since um, the release of the Million Jobs Plan, and um, yeah, we, we've had um, some really exciting conversations. So I'm, I'm hoping that there'll be some exciting um, uh, future announcements in months to come. Fantastic. Question for you, Michael, if you're still there. Um, thank you. The work Ballarat sounds amazing and applicable to Queensland. Are there other emissions sources, not energy, where the industry organisations found opportunities to work together? Yeah, look, uh, thanks for the question. There are, and uh, I should say that um, uh, we had the NAB team for nine days and we made a decision to focus really on, on electricity. Um, gas was an absolute priority, I think, for our, um, for our industries and, and certainly a lot of interest in biogas um, as a replacement for LPG and, and other sources that are being used at the moment. Um, and there was a sense of a collective work around that, collective investment in biogas was the way forward. But more broadly, um, the Central Highlands region uh, has a very strong focus on agriculture, um, uh, carbon capture, carbon sequestration, uh, and particularly um, soil health and, 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 and practice. And whilst it's not necessarily top of the agenda for business in Ballarat, um, there is absolute agreement that for the Central Highlands region, the agricultural sector is a critical part. Um, and in the final piece, which was really identified, was around electric vehicles. And there's a, a couple of smaller LGAs um, in our region who are really looking to, to speed up um, uh, charging stations and provision for EVs through their own LGA practices. So the collective um, approach, I think, is something that has all sorts of benefit. Um, you know, we know that we can get uh, zero emissions much quicker where we do have an, a collective approach. Um, that's been recognised in a number of reports that have been done now and um, in addition to energy, agriculture and transport have been the, the key areas that have been identified. Great. Thanks, Michael. Um, Heidi, a question for you. How important was community support or has community support been in the Gladstone example and or the, um, the Hunter or the other ones that you had up there? So the Hunter Valley is kind of a year ahead of uh, Gladstone in terms of our engagement and certainly within the Hunter the, the community is um, a very important and it's as, as we've sort of alluded to before it's the, the people and the um, industry, uh, unions, commercial entities, um, there's a lot of support in the Hunter um, and in, in Gladstone I've mostly focused so far on Gladstone City Council's state government, um, federal government and um, existing and future industry groups, but there are other organisations engaging with the community, um, including um, ACF and WWF, um, and, and that community engagement is very important, but the, the focus that I'm taking at the moment is really that, um, in, you know, the technical components of what that transition looks like and the, um, in, you know, the economic case for it and being able to articulate that to um, stakeholders. And certainly community is very important, um, but that will be a, probably a, um, a second component. There is a workshop coming up um, in Gladstone around a Central Queensland Energy Summit, and I'm hoping to engage with some communities then in April um, that another organisation, The Next Economy, is putting on. Oh, awesome. Okay. And so just to check out your website, I guess, the BZE org AU for that. If you go to bze.org.au and you scroll down, you can see the second kind of piece of content is a video about renewable energy industrial precincts um, focused on the Hunter and Gladstone with an opportunity um, to find out more information about both of those projects. Thank you. Question here, what are the next steps if a council is interested in providing data into Snapshot to improve accuracy? Just contact us, email. Hello at Snapshot, how about I find put that slide up here right away. If you just email us and say this is what we've got, you'll notice that there are a few councils on Snapshot anyway that have said we've got our data, we want this instead, that's totally fine. Um, we would just ask that I guess you can have a, we can have a chat to you to make sure that it is um, compliant with the, the key international protocols. Final question here just about the decarbonisation um, plan. I think Nikita, you just asked earlier was when I mentioned that there's a there'll be a decarbonisation of the grid that will automatically reduce your emissions profiles. Um, and just to clarify, there's no 
<laughs> national decarbonisation plan that I'm aware of. There's a lot of policies. It would be great if there was one. Um, but I guess the point there is that when you go back and have a look at your snapshots, let's have a look at these ones, for example, and this also goes to the point about making it clear that you're not responsible for all of these going down to zero. A lot of, especially the electricity component of it, as coal-fired power stations start closing down and as they're replaced with um, solar and wind and renewables, it means that there's less carbon in the grid, for want of a better word. The um, emissions factors change and are reduced, and so they start going down um, anyway. And that's why often one of the key interventions for a, a local government or a community is really to be advocating to the state government or the feds because that's a, certainly a big part of it. We might wrap it up there. This session is been and was recorded. So um, for those that missed it, they'll be able to check it out and we'll send that through or if your volume was playing up throughout. Um, want to thank Michael, Heidi and Imogen for coming along and presenting today and um, to Alice, Susan and Dorian as well for our regular catch up to try and frame these webinars. There is one to go. This is when it is. It's on the 29th. And um, as I mentioned, you will be getting an email straight after this with about, you know, three and a half to four seconds worth of feedback. It won't take long. But while it's fresh in your mind, if you, you know, jump onto it now, in fact, what I can also do is put it into the chat box. There we go. So you can jump on now as well if you want. Um, while it's fresh in your mind, and let us know what you think. Um, you want more of this, less of that. We do have the opportunity on the 29th to bring in speakers that you want us to talk to or whoever it might be. Um, please jump on there and let us know and we'll shape the webinar according to that. Uh, that is it for now. Um, we will catch you at the next one. Thanks very much and have a good rest of the day.